Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for part four of a 13-part series as we journey chapter by chapter through uh, Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry. Now, we will have a uh, chapter by chapter read-along and then a review at the end of the read-along for this book. But what happens in this chapter? Well, herein we have the arrival of the mythical Hugh. Hugh comes, Hugh shows up, uh, and him and Yvonne pair off. Uh, Hugh seems to be a pretty nice guy. Um, he and Yvonne, Yvonne share some time together, and they share some memories, and they even share some regrets. There is, herein as well, a little bit of sexual tension. Um, as they walk, a random goat decides to charge them, but disaster is eluded as the goat misses. Um, then the two argue politics. Um, they argue politics for a bit, um, and the argument is put on hold as Hugh spots horses. Yvonne informs him that the horses belong to the casinos. The two find some place to get a drink. And Hugh finally asks the question, are you two divorced? And we get this shortly thereafter on page 119. Do you mean to go back to him or what? Or have you already gone back? Hugh's mare had also taken a sympathetic step forward. You caught that, right? Forgiving my, forgive my being so blunt, but I feel in a horribly false position. I'd like to know precisely what the situation is. This comes to us from Hugh. Then Yvonne responds, so would I. Yvonne did not look at him. Then you don't know whether you have divorced him or not. Oh, I've divorced him, she said unhappily. But you don't know whether you've gone back to him or not. Yes. No. Yes, I've gone back to him, all right. All right? Hugh was silent, while another leaf fell, crashed and hung tilted, balanced in the undergrowth. Then wouldn't it be rather simpler for you if I went away immediately, he asked her gently, instead of staying on a little while, as I'd hoped? I'd been thinking of going to Oaxaca for a day or two anyhow. Yvonne raised her head at the word Oaxaca. Yes, she said. Yes, it might. Though, oh, Hugh, I don't like to say it. Only, only what? Only please don't go away till we've talked it over. I'm so frightened. Um, and then later in their ride, on 121... What do you think about Joffrey? Yvonne asked the question at last. She was leaning forward, resting on the palm and watching him sideways. Hugh, tell me the truth. Do you think there's any, well, hope for him? Their mares were picking up, were, were picking their way delicately among the unusual lane. The foals keep further, keeping further ahead than before, glancing around from time to time, for appropriation, for approbation at their daring. The dog ran ahead of the foals, though he never failed to, to dodge back periodically to see all to see all was well. He was sniffing busily for snakes among the metals. And then on one twenty two Yvonne listen to me. So obviously there are a thousand things to say, and there isn't it going to be and there isn't going to be time to say most of them. It's difficult to know where to begin. I'm almost completely in the dark. I wasn't even sure you were divorced till five minutes ago. I don't know. Hugh clicked his tongue at the horse, but held her back. As for Joff, he went on. I simply have no idea what he's been doing or how much he's been drinking. Half the time you can't tell if he's tied anyway. She says, you couldn't say that if you were his wife. And he replies, wait a minute. 
My attitude toward Joff was simply the one I'd been I'd take towards some brother scribe with a god awful hangover. But I've been in Mexico City. I've been saying to myself, Quibono, Kibono, what's the good? Just sobering him up for a day or two is not going to help. Good God, if our civilization were to sober up for a couple of days, it'd die of remorse on the third. That's very helpful, Yvonne said. Thank you. Um, and then they, they, they ride around for a little bit longer. They sort of ride around and talk about things. Basically, what we get from this chapter in the So What Happens, if you will, we learn that Joff loves Yvonne and that Hugh loves Yvonne and that Yvonne just sort of wants everything and nothing at all. Everything we learn in this chapter that everything going forward will hinge upon Yvonne. It will be her story and no one else's. Uh, it is difficult to say that because the passive character of Joff, Joffrey, holds in his hands the key to all of this. All he has to do, all he has to do, is give up the drink and Yvonne is his. But he's too passive. Joffrey, it seems, is lost. Joffrey's going to continue to drink. It doesn't matter what anyone says. It doesn't matter what anyone does. It doesn't matter who comes back for him. That said, we don't really ever get the feeling during this chapter that Yvonne is out of Hugh's grasp. If Hugh were to take the situation into his own hands and demand, hey, just give me a chance. Give me my chance. Yvonne seems to be willing to do so. Hugh might be too passive to do that. Basically, everyone's waiting around on Yvonne. Um, so we have this on 101 and 102. Yvonne stood below. Uh, this is from Hugh's point of view. Yvonne stood below, smiling up at him, hands in the pockets of her slacks, feet wide apart like a boy. Her breast stood up under her blouse, embroidered with the birds and flowers and pyramids she had probably bought or brought for Joff's benefit. And once more, Hugh felt the pain in his heart and looked away. Hugh doesn't just want Yvonne. Hugh is absolutely in love with her. Um, talking about that goat scene, we have it here on 104. Hugh glanced suspiciously at a billy goat which had been following them on their right along the grass margin between the road and the wire fence, which now stood there motionless, regarding them with patriarchal contempt. No, they're the lowest form of animal life, except possibly... Look out! My God, I knew it. The goat had charged, and Hugh felt the sudden intoxicating, terrified incidence and warmth of Yvonne's body as the animal missed them, skidded, slithered around, abrupt, slithered round the abrupt leftward bend in the road, took at this point... Uh, over the, over a lone stone bridge and disappeared beyond a hill, furiously trailing its tether. Goats, he said, twisting Yvonne firmly out of his arms. Now, uh, basically, what we have here is what we have here is a crash missing the couple. This is obviously emblematic for the things we're going to be coming towards. A crash. Uh, in the text itself. But we also get the introduction of the idea of being intoxicated, the intoxicating feel, the intoxicating warm feel of Yvonne's body. The only thing we have to, well, there's a lot of drunkenness in this novel, but we have to believe that this is a reference to Joff. Joff's the drunkard. And here we have Hugh being drunk off of Yvonne's very presence. Um, this foreshadows that the two of them end up getting 
uh, a little bit toasty together later on. Uh, together, the idea of together on page 110. On the other side to their left, Joffrey's house came in sight, almost a bird's eye view. The bungalow crouching very tiny before the trees, the long garden below descending steeply, descending steeply, parallel with which on different levels obliquely climbing the hill, all the other gardens of the continuous residences, each with its cobalt oblong of swimming pool also descended steeply towards the barranca, the land sweeping away at the top of the Cal Nicaragua, back up to the preeminence of the Cortez Palace. Could that white dot down there be Joffrey himself? Possibly to avoid coming to a place where, by the entrance of the public garden, they must be almost directly opposite the house. They trotted into another lane, inclined to their right. The idea here is, um, the idea here is that the two of them have run away to the woods. The two of them have run away to the jungle. The jungle being the subconscious, the jungle being the, the darkness, the jungle being um, the carnal desires of humankind, the jungle being those things about ourselves that we are afraid to admit, the jungle being the place from which we came. The place from which we came, we are in the consciousness. The consciousness um, is what we admit to the world. So here we have two conscious people in the jungle together, these conscious people in the jungle together, alone together, spying on the quote-unquote civilized world, the civilized world uh, which Joffrey inhabits, the civilized world, which is, at this point, uh, sort of shunning the both of them. Yvonne is a married woman, but she's not. She's divorced, but she's still going back to that relationship. Hugh has his own stuff going on. He lives in another world entirely. He's come back here to his subconscious for Yvonne. They're traipsing around those dark areas together, admitting to each other. Hugh admits to Yvonne, not in so many words, but Hugh admits to Yvonne that he loves her that he wants her, that he's waiting on her answer. Yvonne admits to Hugh that she wants him to stay around. Um, and one of the other things that comes up here is that the, the psychic distance in this novel is very close. Uh, that is that our narrator is very close to inside the head of our characters. But the passage of time is very difficult to tell, uh, making it seem very much like a dream, like the subconscious itself. The subconscious is the, the subconscious rules the dream realm, right? Um, and we're in, when we're in a dream, we have no idea how much time has passed. That's one of the hallmarks of dreams. Um, moving forward a little bit in the novel. So I've got a few points to make. And then I've got a, a main thrust of this chapter. Uh, the main thing that I think this chapter is doing. On page 112 and 113. It was a country of slavery where human beings were sold like cattle and its native peoples, the Yaquis and Papagos and Tamasasic, Tama. Tomasics, Tomasasics, exterminated through deportation or reduced to worse than peonage in their, their lands in thrall or the hands of foreigners. And in Oaxaca lay the terrible Val Nacional, where Juan himself, a bona fide slave aged seven, had seen an older brother beaten to death and another bought for 45 pesos, starved to death in seven months. Because it was cheaper, this should happen, and the slave boy and the slaveholder buy another slave, then simply have one better fed, merely worked to death in a year. 
all this spilt, Perifero Diaz, Rurales, everywhere. Jefes politic politicos and murder and the extirpation of liberal political institutions. The army, an engine of massacre, an instrument of exile. Juan knew this, having suffered it, and more, for later in the revolution his mother was murdered. And later still Juan killed him Juan himself killed his father, who had fought with Huerta, but turned traitor. Ah, guilt and sorrow had dogged Juan's footsteps too, for he was not a Catholic who could rise refreshed from the cold bath of confession. Yet the banality stood, that the past was irrevocably past, and conscience, and conscience had been given a man to regret it only in so far as that might change the future. For man, every man, Juan seemed to be telling him, even as Mexico must ceaselessly struggle upward. What was life but a warfare and a stranger's sojourn? Revolution rages, to, revolution rages too in the tierra caliente of each human soul. No peace, but that must pay full toll to hell. Um... This is what's going on inside of our characters. I know that sounds a bit melodramatic. Um, our characters are at revolution. Our characters are at war. Our characters are in a civil war. Um, this, These are people who obviously know each other and have feelings about one another and for one another, but they are all sort of stabbing each other in the back. On 120... And 121, uh, that's where we get back to, okay, 120 into 121. The railway, a double track of narrow gauge, now div divigated from one of, away from the, this is, some of this book is so hard to read. The railway. A double track of narrow gauge, now divigated away from the grove for no apparent reason, then wandered back again parallel to it. A little further on, as if to balance matters, it made a similar deviation towards the grove. But in the distance it curved away in the wide leftward sweep of such proportions, one felt it must logically come, come to involve itself again with the Tomalin Road. This was too much for the telegraph poles that had stood, that had strode straight ahead arrogantly and were lost from sight. Yvonne was smiling. I see you look worried. That's really a story for the globe in this line. I can't make out what sort of damn thing it is, all right. And she replies, it was built by you English. Only the company was paid by the kilometer. Hugh laughed loudly. How marvelous. You don't mean it was laid out in this cockeyed fashion just for the sake of extra mileage, do you? That's what they say, though I don't suppose it's true. Well, well, I'm disappointed. I'd been thinking it must deliver some delightful Mex it might be some delightful Mexican whimsy. It certainly gives one to think, however. Um A company being paid by the kilometer in order to put up these telephone poles. Um, what you're looking at, what you're looking at is um, things made more difficult by design to be more difficult. Yvonne wants you there. Yvonne is there for Joffrey. This is one hell of a design. And it's been designed by Yvonne. Yvonne has set this all into motion. She left. Now she's back. She's divorced. But she's in the relationship. She wants Joffrey. But she needs Hugh. Everything is... Catacorn, just like um, these poles, the telegraph poles. 
the telegraph poles are set up in order to make communication simple at a distance. Um, one more thing I have to talk about before the main course here, as it were, happens on page 129 into 130. It's a simple little thing, and it reminds me of something personally, but I think that what this is, um, I think that this was written in a way that is gorgeous. There was something in the wild strength of this landscape. Once a battlefield that seemed to be shouting at him, a presence born of that strength whose cry his whole being recognized as familiar, caught and threw back into the wild some youthful passage of courage and pride, the passionate yet so nearly always hypocritical affirmation of one's soul, perhaps, he thought, of the desire to be, to do, good, what was right. It was as though he were gazing now beyond the expanse of the plains and beyond the volcanoes out to the wide rolling blue ocean itself, feeling it in his heart still, the boundless impatience, the immeasurable longing. For me, being 35, this is how it feels to remember my 20s. A very romantic time for myself, a time where I was out to do good, to do right, to be good. And you ultimately, you know, you live the life you have to live. I think that this is worded in a way that could very easily make put everyone in a mindset of some former epoch in their own lives. And what that is doing is that is planted there because these characters are not who they were. These characters are trying to go back someplace. Just like last time, we talked a little bit about um, this character is walking around in a town they used to inhabit, which makes you think of a former you. Here, we have a little bit of narration that puts us in the mind, I think no matter who we are, of a former self. Makes us longingly remember some romantic past, which is exactly what the characters are doing. But I want to go back, uh, I want to go back to what we're doing here. The main thrust of what's going on is that Hugh and Yvonne are riding around. Um, during this riding around, the idea of Judas and Judas's betrayal come up. We're riding around in the subconscious. We're riding around in the wilderness. Because we are in the subconscious, we are in the wilderness, we are in the unguarded, the idea of Judas comes up because the idea of Judas is something so prevalent with betrayal. Both of these characters feel they are betraying Joffrey by being romantically linked to one another. Uh, then on page 117, under these trees, oh, um, the writing around and the idea of betrayal comes up, the idea of Judas comes up, and they decide to stop and get a drink. When they stop and get a drink, there's a little girl playing with an armadillo under a tree. Under these trees, there were a cavalcade. A little girl was playing with an armadillo. Armadillos uh, often represent or often emblematic of a secret carried inside the subconscious. That's sort of what the animal is used to represent oftentimes when it comes up in the literature, when it comes up in um, stories, when it comes up in mythology, when it comes up in the, the subconscious itself. Uh, the idea of an idea which uh, is secret, a hidden truth. Um, it, it represents boundaries that someone has set. Boundaries that someone has set around an idea around a thought because of the hard shell of the armadillo. Um, this scene 
happens outside of a brewery. The brewery would represent Joffrey. Joffrey being an alcoholic. Um, so you have the idea of betrayal with two people who love each other doing the betraying they come across a little girl playing with an armadillo a little girl playing with a guarded secret the child was crouching on her haunches holding the armadillo and apprehensively eyeing the dog who however lay at a safe distance watching the foals inspect the rear of the plant. Each time the armadillo ran off, as if on tiny wheels, the little girl would catch it by its long whip of a tail and turn it over. How astonishingly soft and helpless it appeared then. Now she righted the creature, set it going once more, some engine of destruction perhaps after millions of years had come to this, Quanto, Kianto, I don't know how to say that, Yvonne asked. Catching the animal, the child piped. Cinquenta centavos. And Hugh says, you don't really want it, do you? Hugh, like General Winfield Scott, he thought privately, after emerging from the ravines of the Cerro Gordo, was sitting with one leg athwart the pommel. Yvonne nodded in jest. I'd adore it. It's perfectly sweet. And he says, you couldn't make a pet of it. Neither can the kid. That's why she wants to sell it to you. Hugh sipped his beer. I know about armadillos. Oh, so do I. Yvonne shook her head. Yvonne shook her head, mockingly opening her eyes very wide. But everything. Then he says, then you know that if you let the thing loose in your garden, it'll merely tunnel down into the ground and never come back. Yvonne was still half-mockingly shaking her head, her eyes wide. Isn't he a darling? Hugh swung his leg back and sat now with his tankard propped up on the pommel, looking down at the creature with its big mischievous grin, iguana's tail, and helpless speckled belly. A Martian infant's toy. No, muchos gracias, he said to the little girl, who, indifferent, did not retreat. It'll, it'll not only never come back, Yvonne, but if you try to stop it, it will do its damnedest to pull you down the hole, too. He turned to her, eyebrows raised for some time as they watched each other in silence. As your friend W.H. Hudson, I think it was, found out in, to his cost, Hugh added. A leaf fell from the tree somewhere behind them with a crash like a sudden footstep. Hugh drank a long, cold draft. Yvonne, he said, do you mind if I ask you straight out if you are divorced from Joff or not? The little girl is Yvonne. The brewery, the brewery is Joffrey. The armadillo is Yvonne and Joffrey's relationship. The garden on which Yvonne had worked so deliberately, we remember, and Joffrey had acted so bereft in her absence. Joffrey had torn down that garden. Here we have Hugh telling her, the armadillo, your relationship with Hugh will destroy the garden, will destroy everything you've worked on, and it will run away. It will never be yours. On the kissing page to this, do you mean to go back to him or what? This is Hugh asking her about her relationship. Do you mean to go back to him or what? Or have you already gone back? Hugh's mare had also taken a sympathetic step forward. Give, forgive my being so blunt, but I feel in a horribly false position. I'd like to know precisely what the situation is. And this is where we get into the quote that we read earlier. So would I. Yvonne did not look at him. Then you don't know whether you have divorced him or not. Oh, I've divorced him, she says unhappy. She answered unhappily. But you don't know whether you've gone back to him or not. Yes. No. Yes. I've gone back to him, all right? All right? Hugh was silent while another leaf fell, crashed and hung tilted, unbalanced in the undergrowth. 
then wouldn't it be rather simpler for you if I went away immediately? He asked gently, instead of staying on a little while as I'd hoped. Here, we come to understand that maybe that armadillo, the armadillo with which the little girl is playing, the little girl being Yvonne, maybe the armadillo is Hugh. Hugh would ruin the relationship that she has with Joffrey. So we have a little bit of ambiguity, but O oh, isn't in literature. And later on, on page 120, this is literature's literature. On 128, a faint carillon of bells sounded in the distance, rising and falling, sinking back as if into the very substance of the day. Judas had been forgotten. Nay, Judas had been, somehow, redeemed. Who is Judas? Which character is it that's Judas? That is all I have for this episode of Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry, uh, Chapter 4. I hope to see you next time for Chapter 5, Part 5 of a 13-part series here on the channel.